Hello, everybody. Yes, yeah, so tonight's uh, Bible reading is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verse 9 to 17. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who were they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he, sit, he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Well, let's uh, pray together, folks, before we have the sermon. Our Father, we, uh, we believe as your people that you speak to us through the words of the Bible, that though they were written by people, they were also written by you under the inspiration of your spirit. And so we just ask that you would speak to us tonight. Your servants are listening. Amen. Well, the title of the sermon is Live for Jesus, Worship. Uh, if a group of people get together to do something important and they have a true purpose, it's vital that they don't forget what that purpose is. Um, I don't know much about these things, but I read a book um, in the business world and uh, discovered that in the corporate world, sometimes they, they call this mission drift, where you might drift away from your true purpose or your mission as an organisation. So, for example, a school's true purpose is to educate children. But if you are a teacher, it could be easy to eventually drift into thinking that your real purpose is just to get kids through exams. And if you forget that the ultimate purpose is to educate children as whole persons, you might not do that in the way that you should if you become singularly focused on just getting them through exams. Or even worse, you might consider your true purpose as a teacher to just get yourself through to 3.30 p.m. on a Friday. And I'm out of there. A law firm's true purpose is to get justice for their clients according to the law. But it would be very easy to drift into thinking that the main purpose of the business is just to make money. The results of that would not be good. So mission and purpose can drift. Now what are Christians? What is the ultimate purpose of the church? of you if you're a Christian. At MOBC we say that we want to be a church of disciples of Jesus who make other disciples of Jesus. We say that a lot. A church of disciples of Jesus who make other disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus. And we follow Jesus and we live for Jesus. But what's the true purpose of these things? Why do we do this? The answer the Bible gives is this. The worship of God. When you hear that, you might think, well, that makes sense. I would assume that's what Christians are all about. Or you might think, on the other hand, worship of God? What, what does that even mean, really? Today I want us to remember that above all else, we are to be a worshipping, worshipful people. 
And this takes us beneath or below the goal of making disciples and helping people to find Jesus and to follow him. It takes us beneath that goal to remind us of why we do that. What is the foundation and the purpose of that? We do it because it honours God ultimately. It creates worshippers of God. This is appropriate because God is God. He deserves worship, as we'll see in a minute, I hope. And it's good for us because it's what we're most designed for and what ultimately fulfills us to be worshippers of the living God. So I wonder where, where you sit with that, if that sounds like something that might make sense or not. But this is where our series on discipleship begins because worship is foundational. It lies underneath all that we do as Christians and it's climactic as the Revelation passage shows. It's where we end up. Eternity is the people of God worshipping God. The ultimate reason and the goal of the universe and the secret to true human life and joy is the worship of God. Worshipping, glorifying, honouring God it's connected to all the other things you do as a Christian, the other L's that we talk about at MOBC. To live for Jesus will look like loving people like he does, leaning on him in prayer, learning about him through the teaching of the Bible, leading others to him. If you don't have all those different pieces, if you don't have those different Lego blocks in the Christian life, then the building's going to come down. You need all of those things. As a Christian, I mean, think about it, it's logical. You cannot worship God unless you know something about Him. So you must learn about Him before you can live for Him. But the life of worship is really what the building is. When all the blocks are in place, you could call the building of Christian faith worship, ultimately. Worthship is what the word means. Attributing worth and value to someone who is worthy of it. How worthy do you think God is? So the Bible has a hundred different words and images to talk about this, to worship, to glorify God because he's glorious, or to praise God, or to bow down, etc. But you get the idea. It's not that complicated. The real challenge is believing that Jesus is worth living for and being happy about that and actually personally relying on God himself so that I really do want to and do worship God with my life. And for us as a church, together, I guess the challenge is to be agreed that in this place, we don't just agree with certain ideas. We don't just believe that God exists. We don't just obey the commands of God. We don't just show kindness to other people. Not those things, not ultimately. We have to agree that first and foremost we are worshippers here. We live to love God. We live by needing the life Jesus gives. We are about magnifying, glorifying, praiseifying, worshipifying God. Is that how you see the church and your place in it? Well, that was a long introduction. The Bible passage that helps me remember these things is Revelation chapter 7. And it teaches me what worship really involves and for me it inspires me to want to be a worshipper of God. I hope it moves your heart to want to be a worshipper of God. And I want to make three brief points from the passage today. I want to talk about the washed and worship and the worthy God. The washed who worship a worthy God. So point one, let's think about the washed first. Revelation 7 is a beautiful image of the new heavens and the new earth of eternity. Of God's people living with God in peace forever, worshipping him. But how do you get there? 
Who is allowed to live before God in worship? What's required in order for a person to become a worshipper of God? The answer is, who is there? The washed are there, is the way this part of the Bible puts it. What does this mean? Well, we meet the washed in verse 9. It said, The great crowd before God were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And then it's asked in verse 13, One of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? John answers, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God. It's a strange description. People with white robes that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. But it's not that hard to understand. The lamb is Jesus. The blood is his death in our place. Us who deserve God's judgment because we're rebels against God. His death to take God's judgment from us. This is the only thing that can make a person right with God. The life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And if a person puts their trust in that, they are forgiven forever, washed their sin, their guilt taken away. A person who has stopped trusting in their own life and instead trusts in what Jesus has done for them is cleansed. Guilt gone, debt paid, acceptable to God now and forever, completely. If you're wondering, if you're a Christian, this is very important to know. A Christian is not just someone who believes that God exists. A Christian is not just someone who believes that God should be obeyed. A Christian is someone who has been and who knows they have been saved, rescued and pardoned by God. That's why they cry out in verse 10, salvation comes from our God, praise him. That might be the thing you need to hear from God today. The question, have you been saved? You might think that sounds like a very old-fashioned kind of Christian way to talk, but that's the question the Bible asks. Have you been saved? Have you actually, personally, once and for all, prayed to God and asked Him to save you from sin and death and hell? And for him to make you his own and to say, I put my trust in you and become a Christian. It's only the washed that get to be among the worshippers. But when you are washed by the mercy of a loving God and you come into a relationship with God, inevitably, You want to worship. Partly it's just naturally wanting to thank God with your words and your actions. I mean, that's what we do. We want to honour people that we want to thank if we're grateful. I've seen people on the news who have been rescued um, from drowning or a house fire or pulled out of a car crash. Have you seen those stories where sometimes later on they meet the... um, the person who rescued them outside the hospital or at an award thing for heroes. It's actually quite moving to see somebody meet a person that saved their life. And they meet them outside the hospital, uh, this brave citizen, often a stranger, and they cannot help but praise their rescue. I've never seen one of these stories where the person was kind of annoyed at the person that saved their life. They say, this guy saved me. He is a hero. And, you know, as all true heroes do, the person normally goes, oh, I just, I did what any person would do. And you think, well, maybe some people would do it. I don't think anybody would do it. 
But the person who was saved is, is adamant, you know. I can't believe they say me. Do not say anything bad about this person. They, they are a hero to me. They praise them. They're just grateful. So part of Christian worship is just being thankful to God. I'm a saved person. But it's more than that. It's also that the good news about Jesus reveals and begins to reveal to us the character of God. This one who saved us, we get to know and discover more of what he's like. If he's done this great thing for rebels like us, who is this God? I'm beginning to realize he is God. He is good. My creator, my provider, the source of my life, my purpose, my everything. So I want to worship. What does this look like to respond that way? Well, the imagery of Revelation 7 helps us. It means a life of dependence on God for all that we need, acknowledging that I am dependent on as God as the one who supplies what I need. And it's a life of serving him. Verse 14 says, They serve him day and night. Which is a whole new way to approach your life. To know that this life is for God. You might know the old parable about three bricklayers. I think it's an old Jewish parable. They're laying bricks for the temple. And they're asked, what are you doing? And the first one says, well, I'm laying bricks. The second one is asked, what, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm building a temple. So he has at least some understanding of the reason he's doing this. But the third man is asked, what are you doing? And he answers quite differently. He says, I am building the house of God. They're all basically doing the same thing. They're just laying bricks. But they see it very differently. One is just laying bricks, but the other has elevated the purpose of his activity to its highest order. He does this for God. We need to see all we do as having the highest purpose, serving and loving and worshipping God. So it's this way of thinking about my whole life that is the worship of God. And it's more than that. It's reverence for God. In verse 9, they stand before the throne. The angels in verse 11 also fall down, so it is also for us a kind of bowing down in our heart before God in reverence. It's speaking and singing about God also. Verse 10, they didn't just say, they cried out, not just in a voice, but in a what? Loud voice. Salvation is from our God. They're not ashamed. They speak, they sing. It is felt, it is personal, wonder, awe and love. Can I make a bit of a side point and just say something for a moment about the way we express ourselves as Christians? Because some people worry about this. I'm thinking in particular about the way we do church, the way we sing, pray prayers, the things we do when we get together as Christians at church. It's important to say that we're not all expressive people in the way that we show love and enthusiasm about things just in life. Some people are very reserved. Some people are very enthusiastic. We're all different and that's okay. And it's important to realize that that difference gets expressed in, in the way that a person might show their worship toward God. Uh, it's just different in life. Some people like to hug. Right? They're huggers. They say the world's divided into cat lovers and dog lovers. I sometimes think the world's divided into the huggers and the non-huggers. I don't know that that's true because I'm kind of in between. You catch me on the right day, I'm up for it. Come on in. But you, you catch me on the wrong day, just, okay, back off. All right. 
So some people are huggers, some people are not huggers. Some people are just, that's how they express their affection and their love. But other people do it in other ways. Uh, Some people just prefer to give a gift. Some people like to voice their appreciation. Others like to do it in some other way. Some people are loud, some people are quiet. It's all okay. I've even seen this difference at rock concerts where you expect everybody to kind of be loud and enthusiastic. Um, I've been at a Bruce Springsteen concert with people cheering and I saw this guy and he spent the whole concert, he was just sitting in his seat, but he was enjoying himself. He was, he was just totally calm and, um, and, and had his eyes closed half, half the time and he was just absorbing the wonder of the moment as we all experience the presence of Bruce and it was a wonderful time and he just absorbed the music and, um, and he was very calm and quiet. Um, so that's how he experienced uh, his appreciation. But I did see this other guy at the concert and when Springsteen uh, began his famous song Dancing in the Dark and that started up, this guy was a few rows down, he couldn't help himself. Um, he stood up on his chair, up on his chair in the stadium um, and he turned around actually to face like the rest of the crowd and he just sort of went, yeah, like that. And then he jumped over his chair into the aisle and he began just running up and down the aisle and he, and he was just dancing in the aisle. And he was not, he was not good at dancing. It was, <laughs> it was, it was dad dancing. But his joy was un, undeniable. It's how he expressed things. So there's the way we do praise and song and, and worship here at MOBC, and that's good. That's our style. There's African church full of dancing. That's good. There's people in suits and dresses um, singing old Welsh hymns. That's good. It's all good. It's worshipful to God. Also, when a Christian says, Lord Jesus, as I give to the poor, glorify yourself. As I write this Bible study, let this be an act of worship to you. As I take my neighbour to their chemotherapy appointment, let this honour you. There are many expressions. But it is good to sing and to praise and to smile and to weep and to feel. And it's good because he is so worthy, lastly. The washed will worship. And do not forget, we worship a worthy God. Not just anyone, but a truly worthy God. Is he that to you? So wonderful, so holy, so good. So gracious. Earlier in Revelation chapter 7, in verse 2, he's described as the living God. The living God. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor be to our God forever and ever. Amen. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is the lion, the king. He's on the throne and we stand before the throne, but then he's also described as the lamb. He's the one who gives everything he has for his people. His mercy, he's meek, he is mighty, he's meek, he's everything. He is this for us and this is what makes us so happy, makes us so worshipful. Knowing that we have God himself, we have him. Did you notice in verse 15 it says that the shelter that he provides for us is his presence is himself. The protective shelter is him over you. Not at a distance with us. What kind of God is this? So incredible. So good. More than worthy. The God revealed in Jesus. No one like him. What about the last description in this passage? God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. He doesn't just give the job to somebody else to do on his behalf. He does it himself. The touch of God himself to your face. Think of that. That's a very intimate thing. You wouldn't just let anybody wipe your tears. It's too close. 
Some of our people at church are really going through tough times recently. There's always people at our church going through difficult times, but a lot at the moment. When I speak to them and, and I visit them and pray with them, sometimes you kind of absorb it. I don't know if you've found that with your friends. You absorb something of their pain, don't you? Occasionally I get back in the car and I have a bit of a cry. I'm a bit of a crier, so it's not totally out of the ordinary. But I have a bit of a cry. Uh, Being in the car actually is a wonderful bubble. I don't know if you've ever found that. Nobody can kind of get at you when you're in the car for the next five minutes or so. It's good for crying. Now, if Deborah, my wife, was there, or my own mum, and literally touched my face and wiped a tear and said, Hey, what, what is this? It's okay. The Lord knows what he's doing, and so on. If that happened, I wouldn't flinch. But if you were there and touched my face, I'd go, hey, wait a minute. It's a little too much. It's an intimate thing. This imagery is not accidentally chosen in the Bible. It's a very tender action. God God is this to you. What a way to express his love, his mercy, his deep concern, his character, his presence. Isn't he amazing, isn't it? Isn't he? This is personal. It says in the second last line of our passage that Jesus as the shepherd, he's the lamb, he's the lion, he's also the shepherd, he's... He's all that we need. Leads us to springs of living water. Now I hope you understand the meaning of this. He leads to the water, but the water is him. He is the living water, the Bible says. God himself is the shelter. In the book of Revelation, God himself is the light. And God himself is the water. We are his and he is ours. Jesus said to his disciples, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Have me within you. It just means we have him, himself, as life. God gives you himself as your all-satisfying everything. Kind of makes you want to, I don't know, worship him. Worshipping him is drinking him in, receiving him. Him. Not just the things he gives. Him. To have God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the purpose and the goal and the ultimate good. He supplies himself to you in Jesus. And he says, come and have me as friend, as saviour, as God. I know I said it before, forgive me for repeating it, but we mustn't just learn about God. Learning about God is just preparation for leading you to God. God himself in all his beauty and his greatness. Have you come to God? John Piper says it's a bit like cooking food. John Piper, the American pastor. Cooking is essential if you want to eat. But it's not the same thing as eating, is it? As tasting as feasting, as drinking. There's the preparation and then there's the thing itself. Don't confuse the two. Don't just cook, eat. Don't just have ideas about God. Have God. Don't just know about God. Know God. Don't just learn. Worship. Let God be your joy. Don't just think about him. Drink. No God. But look, it's better coming from John Piper himself. I want you to watch this short video to, begin to, uh, to finish tonight on eating, not just cooking, and drinking, not just thinking. It only goes for about two minutes. And you'll discover that John is one of those people amongst us who's of the enthusiastic type uh, in the way that he lives and the way that he preaches. He says this. 
What Jesus offers in himself is satisfying to the soul. I still want you to miss this. You know, I'm a Christian hedonist, which means that virtually everything I think about and every sermon I give and every counseling session I have and every visitation to the hospital I make, I have one main goal. I want to awaken affections for God and satisfy them with God. That's, that's the way I see everything in the world. I don't mainly think about ideas, though I'm a really idea guy. Ideas are totally cooking, not eating. Ideas are totally about clearing springs away, digging wells, not drinking. I'm after drinking, not thinking. Thinking is a workhorse. Take me to the spring. I'm, I'm born to drink. I want to be happy forever, totally. Nothing small, big, deep. Long, strong, unshakable joy. That's what I want. The whole world wants it. They don't know. They're dribbling their, their lives away on a thousand things that cannot satisfy. All I want to do is what Jesus is about right here. Come. Well, I hope it makes you want to live for, with and because of Jesus, and I hope it makes you want to worship. Let me pray. Our Father, we thank you for the God you are. Very, very, very worthy of worship. Thank you for washing us, for saving us through the sacrifice of Jesus the one who has all but gave it all for us. What a God you are. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the merciful, holy, perfect, righteous, tender, loving, wise, providing, eternal, holy God that you are. It is our purpose to live for and worship you. By your grace, let us do that, please. In Jesus' name, amen.